I'm going to move on straight to our next presentation in the interest of us sticking to time. Our next speaker is Dr. Matthew Amady. He's a research fellow at the Charles Perkins Centre in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. And the title for his presentation is Device Measured Physical Activity Type, Posture and Cardiometabolic -meta Health Markers. Matthew, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Can I just confirm that you can see my screen currently? All right. Thank you very much. Good evening and good morning, everyone. And thanks for being here today. So I'll be going over the first of our two pooling projects that we'll be discussing. Before I get into that, I just like to, before I get into the project that I'm going to be discussing, I want to take a step back and briefly go over the process that the ProPass team took that got us to this point here today. As much of this will be similar between both my presentation and Joe's presentation. So for these two projects, we received data from six different cohorts representing five countries across the globe. This included Australia, England, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Finland. From these cohorts, we harmonized around 40 different lifestyle and health variables, as well as about 10 different cardiometabolic markers, such as glycated hemoglobin, lipid profile, and triglycerides. What was most important was that each of these six cohorts also provided us with dye-worn wearables data. And as Peter just nicely went over, with this data, we processed it through ActivePass to extract a variety of different physical activity types. And then we also took it one step further and extracted some information on these activity types around their patterns and bouts across the day, as well as their intensity levels using cadence-based metrics. Now, coming back to my particular project, Going into it, we were very aware the majority of the evidence base has mainly focused around activity intensity with health outcomes such as cardiovascular health and cardiometabolic health. And this is due largely to the fact that in order to measure activity types, which is greatly lacking in the evidence base, you really need wearables data and wearables resources to measure activity type really accurately at a granular level. What's well, also important the latest iteration of the public health and clinical guidelines both emphasize the need to expand the evidence base on the associations and health effects of activity type, as well as identifying feasible and accessible forms of everyday activities that individuals can engage in to improve and accumulate activity across the day. So with this in mind, for the current project, we associate the dopest boss associations of device-based measures of activity types and posture with cardiometabolic health markers. We looked at several different types of activities and postures, mainly sitting, standing, walking, running, and stair climbing. And for our primary outcome, we looked at overall cardiometabolic health using a composite score derived from body mass index, weight circumference, total cholesterol, high-density lipoprotein, hypocerides, and glycated hemoglobin. In all of our analyses, we adjusted for a variety of covariates that we had previously harmonized, such as smoking status, alcohol consumption, and self-rated health. So we are now to the results. We saw some very interesting associations in this project, mainly that with walking and mainly with running and stair climbing, we saw that there was a very similar magnitude of association between these two activity types up until around 10 to 15 minutes per day after which we began to see some divergence where running became stronger than stair climbing. However, when the daily duration was less than that, the association magnitude was very similar, which was notable. Moving on to comparing walking and standing, we saw that there was roughly a three to one ratio between these two activity types. It took about three hours per day of standing before we observed favorable cardiometabolic health, whereas it took around 60 minutes of walking per day before we observed the same favorable cardiometabolic health. And now moving on to our findings for sitting, we found that the adverse associations of sitting begins increase linearly after about 10 or 10 and a half hours per day of sitting with unfavorable cardiometabolic health observed after about 12 hours per day of sitting. Based on these initial findings, we then decided to go one step further and look at the potential modifying effects of activity type on the adverse associations of sitting. So first, we looked at the modifying effects of walking. And what we saw was that when participants walked between 60 to 90 minutes per day, 
it attenuated the adverse associations of sitting time. Whereas if they walked more than 90 minutes per day, this completely eliminated those adverse associations that we previously saw. And now with stair climbing, we saw that when participants walked between three to eight minutes per day, this almost completely eliminated those adverse associations, except for the very high end of sitting above 13 hours per day. And then when participants were stair climbing eight minutes or more per day, this also completely eliminated those adverse associations. From this, we concluded some of our key findings with between running and stair climbing, there was a similar magnitude of association up until about 10 to 15 minutes per day. And then between standing and walking, there's about a three to one ratio between these two activities in their association. And the limitations of this project was that it had the cross-sectional design, which limits our inferences on causality. And all of our cohorts represented high income countries with little representation from the low to middle income countries. For our future directions, we plan to do prospective linkage with health, with health outcomes to further assess these relationships with hospitalizations and eventually mortality risk. And then before closing, I'll like to give acknowledgments to the ActiPath team, the ProPass team, the British Health Foundation advisory panel that also helped with ProPass, as well as all the individual cohorts that provided data and helped us along the way across this three-year journey thus far. And thank you very much for your time. Matthew, thank you very much. Great to see these first kind of sets of results emerging from the work that we've been doing over a few years now with ProPass. So great to see these things coming to fruition and making their way out into the, uh, into the evidence. I haven't received any questions in the Q&A. So if you have any burning questions, please do pop them in there now. We have a little bit of time for Matthew to address those. Whilst those are coming in, if I could start, Matthew, one of the key areas of debate with regards to um, sedentary behavior, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. with regards to sedentary behavior and sedentary time is whether we should be setting a target there within our public health guidelines. Is there a threshold that we could put out there for the public for a, a, a point that they should limit their sedentary time? Now, you, you referred to 10 hours as a potential kind of break point in terms of associations with health markers in this study. I just wondered what your take on on the appropriateness of having a threshold and whether we have sufficient evidence to to make that recommendation at this point. Based on these findings, because they're only cross-sectional, we really should limit our inferences on it. Yes, they're very nice findings, but then taking that bigger picture with the current information that's available, mainly being reliant on self-report or hip worn accelerometry, we know that those don't provide as accurate of a measure of sitting behavior or sitting time as a thigh base. But I think as ProPath continues to grow and we get the prospective health, we'll be able to more definitively address those questions that you're bringing up, Andy, right now about what's the optimal threshold for sitting time per and how will that potentially influence the next iteration of our guideline. Right now, I would have to say, would it be a little bit too early to give a definitive answer to that? Thank you, Matthew.